Hello, this video concerns equilibrium. We're going to talk about the conditions necessary to say that an object is in equilibrium and then we're going to talk about a procedure for solving equilibrium problems and then we're going to look at some actual examples themselves and try to solve some common equilibrium problems. Okay, so equilibrium means balance and here is somebody who, in equilibrium, obviously very difficult to achieve and, and maintain um, but you can see immediately, I think, from this photo what equilibrium is all about. So an object in equilibrium um, is balanced, okay? So it's not going to accelerate, it's not going to turn, um, and it's not going to change its shape. Okay, so we can say that all the forces on the object in equilibrium are balanced. And you can see here that there's lots of forces going on, and that, but they're all in balance. And also the moments on the object, so all the turning effects of those forces are also balanced. So it's not going to accelerate in a straight line and it's not going to accelerate in any angular or rotational way. Okay, so that's the, the concept. So let's try and formalize that into a set of, uh, of statements that um, give us some conditions necessary. So there are effectively two conditions that need to be satisfied to say that an object or a system, okay, it doesn't have to be a single object, it can be a system of objects, is um, actually in equilibrium. The first one, this blue one here, concerns translational equilibrium. And when we say translational equilibrium, we mean objects moving um, in a straight line. Okay, so what we say there is that the vector sum of all the forces acting on the object equals zero. Uh, so we're saying the vector sum, so that's obviously taking their directions into account. So whichever direction you specify, when you take the vector sum of the forces in that particular direction, which can be any direction, they must add up to zero. So that's the first one, vector sum of all the forces acting on the object equals zero. The second one, this one down here in red, says that the sum of all the moments about any point equals zero, which means effectively that the principle of moments is in operation as well. So for an object in equilibrium, the sum of all the clockwise moments around any point, not necessarily the pivot, but any point, must equal the sum of the anti-clockwise moments about that point. And those two statements are key to understanding equilibrium. And, you know, this, question's at the, this, this statement at the top is often turned into a question for part A of a, some, some exam question. So it would say, just state the two conditions that must be satisfied. And those are the two right there. Okay, so how do we actually turn that theory into practice when we're looking at equilibrium problems? Okay, so when we're solving problems, we effectively split the first condition up into two, and the second one is the, is the principle of moments. So these two here in blue are effectively condition number one split up into two equations. All right, so what we do is we say, let's have a look at the situation in the vertical plane uh, or the vertical direction. And we say, we identify all the upward forces and all the downward forces. And we write an equation that relates the upward and the downward such that the sum of the upward acting forces equals the sum of the downward acting forces. And this is quite easy to write more succinctly as up equals down. So it's an easy one to remember. So you write an expression that satisfies the up equals down. So all the act forces acting up equal all the forces acting down. And then you look at the horizontal uh, direction and you do exactly the same thing. So you identify all the forces that are acting to the left and all the forces that are acting to the right. And you sum the leftward acting ones and you set them equal to the rightward acting ones. So again, we can say that in a much more succinct way, left equals right. Okay. So those two satisfy condition one about the vector sum of all the forces equaling zero. Then for number two um, is effectively, as I say, the principle of moments. So you identify all the clockwise moments and you identify all the anti-clockwise moments and you write down an equation that satisfies this. You sum the clockwise moments and you set them equal to the sum of the anti-clockwise moments. Now, some of these, so let's just write that down. Clockwise equals anti-clockwise. Some of these equations are gonna contain unknown quantities. And the job when you're um, 
solving these problems is to find the unknown quantities like it is in any other physics problem. So um, that's, that's the way to do it. So you write down these three equations that satisfy the up equals down, the left equals right, and the clockwise equals anti-clockwise. So we're going to talk through that process in a minute in terms of a real example so you can get a hang of on um, what I actually mean by that. But let's have a quick look at the procedure. Okay, number one, you identify all the forces. Okay, so some of them are going to be written down for you. Some, some of them may not be, for example, when you've got a force at a hinge or a pivot, um, which you always have, uh, that might not actually be identified. Then what you do, some of them may be acting at angles, and we'll have a look at one of those um, later on. You have to resolve them all into their x and y components because obviously we just want to deal in the x and y directions like we always do in mechanics. So if there's any acting at angles, you find their x components and their y components. Then if necessary, if it's not obvious, you choose a point to be the pivot. So in some equilibrium problems, you need to use moments and therefore you need a pivot. It's sometimes not obvious where the pivot needs to be. So, but you're free to choose any point because if you remember back to our um, condition, the sum of moments about any point. So sometimes it's necessary to choose a point to be the pivot. So that's the third thing to do. Once you've done all that, you write down your three equations that satisfy the two conditions for equilibrium. So that's your upward forces equal downward, your leftward forces equal rightward, and your clockwise moments equal your anti-clockwise moments. When you've got those three equations, you should be able to find one that allows you to find an unknown quantity. So we're talking about an equation that's only got one unknown. Quite commonly, you'll have a couple of equations which have more than one unknown, and so you can't use them to find something. But you should always, if the question's a good one, you should always be able to find one equation that only has one unknown out of your three. So once you've found the unknown in that equation, if necessary, then keep going, substitute that one that you've just found into another equation, and then you should be able to use that equation to find another unknown, and so on and so on until you've found everything that's required by the question. Okay, so let's have a go at that. All right, so here's our first problem. Um, now, problems can be kind of categorized into different um, types, and this is what I call the lorry on the bridge problem. And it's where you've got um, a beam which is supported at two points and you have reaction forces which will be R2 at this end and R1 at this end okay and our job here is to find the reaction forces at the supports so we've got a 20 meter long um, bridge or beam whatever it is and the beam has a weight okay so this is the weight of the beam here 10,000 newtons there's an object on the bridge presumably a lorry um, which has a weight of 30,000 newtons and at this particular point in time, that object is six meters from support number two. Okay, so what we're going to do is try and find reaction support, no, reaction force number one. Well, that's a question mark there. Let me just rub that out and do that again. Um, okay, reaction force number one and reaction force number two. Those are our unknowns. Okay, so what we're going to do is write down our three equations for vertical, horizontal, and rotational equilibrium. So in the vertical direction, let's just circle that one so we know we're working vertically. Okay, so this is our up equals down. All right, so upward we have R1 and we have R2. So the sum of those two the forces acting up must equal the sum of the forces acting down. So downward we have 10,000 newtons and 30,000 newtons. So in total, therefore, we have 40,000 newtons. Okay, so R1 plus R2 equals 40,000 newtons. That's not very useful to us because we've got two unknowns. So let's keep going. Um, horizontally, in this particular example, we actually have no forces acting. All the forces are vertical, so we can ignore those. And then in the rotational uh, aspect, we have no pivot that's specific. So what we need to do is we need to choose a point to be the pivot. Now, because we've got two unknowns, it would be very helpful for us to choose one of those points as the pivot. So 
because this distance is given to us, I'm going to choose R2 as the pivot. So I'm going to say that's my pivot there. Okay. Now, why have I done that? Well, that's because we're going to work with moments now. We, the rotational one is the sum of the clockwise equals the sum of the anti-clockwise moments. If you put the pivot here, then the distance from the pivot of force R2 is zero, and therefore its moment is zero. And therefore, effectively, we can ignore force R2 when we're dealing with the rotational aspect as long as the pivot is there. Okay, so we identify our pairs and we work out the moments from those forces. So we've got a pair here. This pair here forms the moment. So we've got 30,000 times six. Now that one acts this way to turn the bridge anti-clockwise. We've also got a force of 10,000 newtons, which assuming the bridge is uniform, as we must, because we're not told otherwise, it's acting at a distance of 10 meters from, from this end. Okay, so that distance in there is half the length of the bridge and therefore the weight is acting halfway long. So we've got another pair there, so 10 times 10,000. And that one is also acting anti-clockwise. We've also got this force over here, R1, which is providing a clockwise moment trying to push the bridge over that way. And that's acting 20 meters from the pivot. So we've got a pair here, all right? So we've got R1 and 20 meters, and that is um, a clockwise moment acting around in that direction there. Okay, so now we can write down an equation for the sum of the clockwise equals the sum of the anti-clockwise. So we've got 20 times R1, which is that moment there, that's the only clockwise moment, is equal to the sum of the anti-clockwise moments, which is this one. So it's 10,000 times 10. Plus, just put that in brackets, this one here, 30,000 times 6. 30,000 times 6. Okay, so now hopefully you can see, whoops, sorry, uh, I've just pressed the wrong button because I can't reach my, let me just get rid of that. Hopefully you can see now from this that it's quite easy to find R1 because R1 is the only unknown in this equation. So R1 will be this one plus this one divided by 20. And, oops, I've lost my pen again now. And when you do that and you work out all the, um, arithmetic, you end up with a force R1 equal to 140,000 newtons. And you can check that on your calculator if you like. Okay, so R1 equals 140,000 newtons. So that's solved for R1. We can now substitute R1 into this vertical equation um, because now the only unknown is R2. So R1 is 140,000, so 140,000 plus R2 is going to be equal to 400,000 newtons, which means that R2 must be equal to 260,000 newtons. Okay, so you can see that by writing down, in this case, two equations, because there's no horizontal, but more generally these three equations, you should be able to solve for any unknowns that you need. Okay, so that's the Laurier on the bridge problem. Let's have a look at a few more.